Yeah. So. Okay. So do you want to make it like a full screen mode so that uh, we can, we have a larger. Uh, uh, yeah. This is. Slide. Can you see my? It, it looks like a full screen on my side. Oh, but on our side, uh, it's a. Uh, uh, we can still see the the menu of your uh, PDF readers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, that's weird. Uh, so can you see my uh, mouse here? Yeah, I can see them. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know what's going on. Uh, no worry. Maybe so you just your first uh, display. The, the, yeah. How Maybe about your this? first uh, still not working. Still not a full screen. Yeah. How about now? Uh, maybe you can first stop share and then uh, do the. Uh, uh, share screen and see whether it works. Okay. Uh, yeah, now it okay. works. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let me do okay. uh, like a quick introduction and then uh, we can start. Okay. All right. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, hello everyone. Yeah, welcome to uh, CS201 uh, Computer Science Department Seminar. So today uh, it's my great pleasure to have Dr. Lee from Amazon to visit us virtually and give this uh, seminar talk. So Dr. Lee is a senior principal scientist at Amazon. Uh, he received his PhD degree in computer science from Rutgers University. After that, he has held several research positions uh, in Yahoo, Microsoft and Google. Uh, his main research interests are in reinforcement learning, uh, including contact bandits and other related problems in artificial intelligence. His work has found applications in, for example, recommendation systems, advertising, web search, and the conversation systems. He has won many, uh, several best, best paper award at SML AI Stats and the Wisdom. He regularly serves as every chair or senior program committee members at major AI and machine learning conferences, including AAAI, AI, uh, SML New Rivers, and uh, EJCAT. Okay, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Lee to give this seminar talk. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Gu. Um, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to come to give the talk, and uh, it's my pleasure to to uh, to share some of our recent work uh, with the group here. Um, so um, yeah, so um, today I'm going to talk about. Um, particular topic in reinforcement learning, uh, which is something that uh, my colleagues and I have been working for uh, uh, quite a while. It's called policy estimation. And I'll explain what the problem is and, and why this is important soon. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. So is the slide working fine? Yeah. Yeah, uh, okay. it works very well. Good, yeah. good. good. Um, so yeah, so reinforcement learning is a general, very general paradigm for um, decision-making use based on data. Um, and people have been using it to capture, to formulate a number of applications and with, uh, with promising results, uh, such as games, robotics, recommendation, and, and many other problems. At the end, um, it is the essence of the, pro uh, the setting is to have a autonomous agent, which is the robot in the picture that interactively, um, uh, interactively take decisions and observe states and rewards in an unknown environment. And then through this interaction, um, gradually finds an optimal policy to select actions so that the rewards are maximized. Um, the, um, so when people try to use RL or reinforcement learning to solve a uh, particular problem, uh, the, the major steps are not so different from typical supervised learning, which I assume more people are uh, familiar with. Um, after the problem is formulated, we often uh, start with data collection uh, and then train the model or uh, the policy in the RL case and then do evaluation. Um, it happens that in, in the majority of supervised learning, uh, many people focus on model training and modeling and training, which is the second step. But in RL, all three components are very challenging. Uh, the data collection correspond to the exploration and training correspond to policy or value function learning. And then finally evaluation, which is to see whether the, the output of the second step, the policy is good or not, 
Um, this is called our policy estimation in, being, uh, in reinforcement learning. And this is the, uh, the topic that we are going to uh, talk about today. And informally, a policy estimation or OPE asks the following question. Um, given a policy, how can I tell whether the policy is good or not without, having, without actually running the policy on the real system? Um, and this problem is very important in practice. Um, uh, let me give an example. Uh, some people might have seen this uh, example before. Um, that is, um, when, I, uh, when I was at Yahoo, one of the problems that people there care a lot about is the, uh, was the uh, news recommendation problem. Um, there, um, people, uh, uh, we, want to, we wanted to recommend news articles to users so that, um, uh, use, so that uh, users find the articles interesting. So if we want to uh, increase the user's engagement measured by the number of clicks, we can define the, the reward as the one when there's the click or zero when there's no click. And then the state um, is the user information and actions are the news articles that we could recommend. Um, and then a typical eva evaluation dilemma happened in practice. When people try to say, uh, when people try to, to improve the policy with some new idea, um, before the policy got deployed to serve real users, um, um, usually we, we needed to, uh, uh, to validate the, the quality of the policy, meaning that uh, its performance have to uh, surpass a certain threshold. But it, it seems that the only way or the natural way to observe whether the policy is good enough is to deploy the policy and to serve real users and see in an A-B test how, how well it is. So this is a dilemma. Um, and this, this motivates the question of OPE, where uh, if we can evaluate the performance of a new policy without actually deploying the policy to serve real users, then, um, then it will make the whole process much easier. Um, and this is fundamentally a statistical estimation problem where we try to estimate a certain performance metric of a policy from data. Um, and then in the RL literature, um, a very common approach to doing this is uh, to build a simulator. Uh, in the examples of uh, uh, games that we, uh, this is nice because games, uh, simulators are the, the real environment of games. These games happens on computers. Um, but when we talk about uh, robotics, um, things start to get uh, interesting. And when people's or users are involved like recommendation and advertising, or uh, even more, more challenging is uh, driving and, and conversation, then building a simulator is not that easy. In fact, um, building a simulator can be harder than solving the problem itself. Um, so in, in many real, realistic scenarios, uh, simulators can often be a rather inaccurate approximation of reality. Um, and then, but this is the, uh, the best we as RL researchers typically have access to. Um, and this problem is pretty uh, uh, common. Um, if you look at um, the papers in the literature, for example, um, I look at the uh, uh, 55 papers that I found from 13 RL sessions and I sent uh, two years ago. Um, if you look at the type of problems that people uh, uh, do experiments on, um, a majority of them are games, uh, simulated control and, and other problems. Um, the papers that touch real data is really rare. Um, in fact, it's the number of papers that are used, that use real data is smaller than number of papers on um, pure theoretical papers which is a little bit uh, strange. Um, the, um, if you look at the outlier papers, the three outlier that touch real data, um, it's, um, the, it's on robotic arms where people actually build the robots to, to run experiments on. Another is device replacement where uh, people can easily, well, not easily, but at least people can afford to run experiments on. A third one is advertising um, where people use our policy uh, evaluation to do experiments to compare different methods based on real data. And this is the, uh, uh, the OPE topic that we're going to talk about today. So, um, so the, um, the hope of OPE is that um, hopefully they can, uh, it provides a set of tools or a set of mechanisms to, ask, to compare, to evaluate different RL algorithms based on real data so that we, 
we don't have to restrict ourselves, restrict our research and work in the simulated world, but we can apply some of these methods to uh, real data and see um, whether um, we can solve real problems. Um, so let me, um, so these are the ex uh, ex some of the examples and uh, motivations of why we need to uh, look at OPE, which is to uh, tackle the evaluation problem. And now let me describe the problem uh, uh, more precisely. Um, and eventually we need some uh, notation to, to make the discussion more, uh, more precise. Um, let me start with the MDP, which is I, I think people are quite familiar with. Um, MDP is a uh, common model that has been studied in reinforcement learning for decades. Um, it has a set of state space, S, a set of actions, A, and then um, T is the transition probability that tells you what is the probability of transition uh, going to a next state given the current state and action. Um, and then there is, there's a reward function R uh, that gives you the one step or the immediate reward function. And also mu zero, which is the initial state distribution and, and H is the horizon. Um, and, and, then, um, and then we have uh, bottom in, at the bottom of the, uh, the slide, you uh, define the trajectory, which is a uh, sequence of state action rewards up to a horizon H. So H is the length of the trajectory. Um, the first state is drawn from the initial state distribution mu zero. And then uh, if you have a policy pi, you use pi to sample state given the current, uh, sorry, you use pi to sample actions given the current state. Um, and the next state is sampled from the transition probability kernel. Uh, and then this is how you can uh, generate a trajectory, which is a random object. Um, and then given the trajectory, you can compute the return which is the, uh, uh, the average reward average over the H steps. And then if finally, the quantity that we, we want to uh, estimate in this talk is the value of the policy. Um, it is defined as the expectation of the return. Um, and the higher the better, because we want to maximize reward. Uh, but here in this talk, uh, we're not going to talk about how to maximize the policy or optimize the policy, but rather we just estimate this quantity v of pi given a policy pi. Um, is, is there any question about the notation here in the setup? Uh, if no, then uh, we could uh, talk about the, um, uh, more about the estimation of the policy value. Um, there are generally two ways of estimating the policy value. Uh, one is the uh, is called on policy estimation. Uh, this is the natural choice when you can actually run the policy on say real users. So all you need to do is to use uh, pi to say recommend news articles to a user and wait for a week or two and then um, see how well it, how well it does on uh, on real users. Um, and this method is very natural, is correct and straightforward, uh, but it's often risky and costly and sometimes it's impossible to run uh, policy in an policy way uh, in certain domains like healthcare because of ethical reasons. Um, another approach uh, which is called off policy estimation um, is as follows. Um, it doesn't require to run the policy, the new policy on users or patients, but rather it relies on historical data set D bar that is generated by some historical or historical behavior policy pi zero. And, and then you use D hat, sorry, D bar to estimate the same policy value. Um, if, you, if we can do this the, in the op policy way, then we can estimate the, the quantity of interest in this cheap and safe way because we don't need to collect new data and run a new policy. Um, but the technical challenge here is that the data set D bar is biased because it's collected by the behavior policy pi zero. If you just average the rewards in D bar naively, then what it estimates is the uh, value of the behavior policy, not the value of the policy that you care about, pi. Okay. Um, so this is the, the, the key technical challenge when we uh, do our policy estimation, how to correct the distribution mismatch. Um, some people who are familiar with causal inference may realize that um, this is very related to something called the, the Neiman-Rubin causal model. Uh, in this 
turns out to be a special case of the a policy estimation uh, in reinforcement learning, where you have a one step problem, which corresponds to horizon H equals one, um, and action space is two is binary, you have a new drug and a placebo, uh, and you want to see whether uh, the new drug is better than placebo in terms of curing a certain disease or uh, improving the condition of a patient. Um, and then at the end of the day, what you want to do is to um, compute the difference between the treatment and control effects. Um, if this is positive, then, then you know that the, uh, the new drug is better than the placebo. Um, in supervised learning, um, uh, in uh, supervised learning, this is also known as a uh, covariate shift problem where uh, we change the distribution of uh, the input feature X, uh, but Y, the label Y given feature X remains the same. Um, and when you want to train the, a classifier, you need to uh, address the covariate shift problem between your training data and test data. Uh, and then, uh, and then this example is a news recommendation problem that we described earlier. Um, and this is some, uh, some old result that shows that uh, if you can do a policy estimation effectively, then, uh, uh, then you can use, rely on historical data to predict the online metrics, the click-through rates or other metrics without actually running to, uh, without actually having to run the policy. And these two curves here correspond to this op policy estimation and this, uh, the actual online metrics. So if you can do uh, your policy easily, then uh, you can save a lot of these online experimentation efforts. Uh, okay. um, and as a last example, uh, before we go to more technical contents is the, uh, the family function example uh, uh, in the fast track prevention program by uh, Susan Murphy's group uh, a while ago. Um, the problem here is how to prevent or reduce conduct disorder of children. Um, and, and the information or the state here is the child's behavioral condition at the end of the semester. Um, and then you can, as an action, you can uh, determine the number of home visits scheduled in the next semester. And the reward is the um, academic achievement in uh, H equals 10 semesters. And each time that correspond to one semester. And so so now the, the problem here is that um, can you, let's say you have a new uh, prevention policy that selects A given S for the child. And the goal is to uh, improve or maximize the child's academic achievement 10 semesters from now. How can you use historical data to compare two policies? And this is a multi-step uh, example where H is bigger than one. And in, in the previous example here, um, H is one, including the uh, the, the causal effect estimation problem and the news recommendation problem here. Um, and okay, so now let's look at how we could solve the OPE problem. Um, if the data is in the following form, um, as we mentioned before, um, data is collected by, is generated by behavior policy. And what it means is that uh, D bar is a collection of trajectories, tau, uh, tau i, and each tau i is a sequence of uh, horizon h, land h. Um, and what is important here is that in the data set, d bar, actions are selected by the behavior policy. Um, and then, oops, the behavior policy. Um, and then at the end of the day, what we try to do is to estimate the, the v pi based on the data set and the target policy as input without knowing the transition or the reward function. Um, and then, and then um, there's some people may, uh, may, uh, may be familiar with RL and know that there is the concept called the Q function, or is a, one of the value functions that are commonly studied in reinforcement learning. Um, it generalizes the policy value uh, in the following way. Um, it's defined as the um, QSA is defined as the expected uh, reward if you uh, follow a policy pi and starting from state S and, and starting with action A. And assume that you can uh, you have access to this quantity, this Q function, then a policy value is just the average of the initial state's Q value when actions are chosen according to pi. Okay? And then you can um, 
and if you have data, you can solve for pi in in uh, many ways, uh, such as dynamic programming, linear programming, or, or model-based approach. Um, and then one, and then the uh, one popular approach is the uh, is the follows. Um, it's a model-based approach. Uh, sometimes it's called regression estimator. So what it how what it does is to use the data set to estimate the transition and reward function of the MDP. And let's call it T hat and R hat. And then you can compute Q hat or an estimate of the Q function from this estimated model. And then estimate the value of the policy by um, using this uh, Q hat as, uh, as in the previous, uh, as here, right? Here V pi is just an expectation of the true Q function. And now once you have an estimated Q function, then all you need is to plug in your estimated Q function to get an estimated uh, policy value. Um, the, uh, the problem with this approach is that uh, when you estimate T and R, especially in the uh, uh, continuous state case, um, usually you can't easily control the bias in, in the modeling assumption of T and R. So um, even if you can get it estimate, it's hard to see how well or how accurate the estimate is. Uh, another approach is based on the idea of important sampling or also called the inverse propensity score. Um, the idea is very simple. Uh, remember that the, the policy value is defined as the expectation of the, uh, the return, okay? When the trajectory is generated by uh, your, uh, the target policy pi. Um, and then all you need is just to uh, change the measure or use an importance weight here when tau is generated by uh, the behavior policy. Okay. So all you need is just to use this weight to, uh, to do a weighted average of the rewards in your data and then you get uh, an unbiased estimate of the true policy value. And this quantity, the ratio of two probability uh, can be uh, further simplified uh, thanks to the Markovian assumption, it can be further simplified to into the form of a product of uh, ratios between the, uh, the target policy and the behavior policy of uh, individual actions conditioned on the, uh, the corresponding states. And these are ob observed from data. So you can uh, compute this uh, in, well, in, you don't have to act, uh, estimate it. You can compute it from data and and this is the propensity score or the ways that you can use to debias your data. Okay. Um, and then the problem with this is that um, it's, uh, the variance is often high. Um, so there are other methods called double robust can, that can combine the regression estimator and, and the IPS into a new estimator um, that has uh, certain nice properties. Um, for today, may, uh, let me skip this and I'm happy to go back to this. Um, uh, if people are interested. Uh, there are many other uh, variants of IPS and DR. So it seems that um, they provide a set of uh, useful estimators for OPE. Uh, now, the problem is that um, these methods are not widely used in practice when you have a long horizon problem. For example, these methods are very uh, commonly used in contextual bandits, which correspond to H equals one case. But when H is big, um, these methods are not very uh, popular uh, because of a phenomenon we call the curse of horizon. Uh, let me explain what the curse of horizon problem is. Um, if you have a, um, a trajectory of length H, a tau here, and remember that in IPS, we need to compute this ratio. And this ratio can be expressed as a product of uh, H ratios, pi over pi zero ratios. Okay. And you can easily show that um, this ratio can blow up exponentially in H. Um, and then this is a bad thing because um, if you have a, you, you want to estimate something, uh, a, quant a random quantity, the expectation of a random quantity, and that random quantity is variance uh, ex exponential. And so it means that you need exponentially many data to, to have a good estimate of that expectation, right? Um, so this is bad. And we can, you can show that um, this exponential blow up is not avoidable in the min and max rate. So in the worst case, this is something that has to happen. Um, there's no way around. 
Um, and this is similar for other improvement of uh, method that relies on this ratio, such as uh, doubly robust and other uh, methods. Um, you can do approximation like uh, the retrace method to artificially reduce the or control the variance, but then it comes with the cost of introducing bias um, that is hard to estimate and control. Um, so now this comes the question of, um, can we break this curse of horizon, at least in the benign case? Um, and this is the, um, and there's a, a lot of recent work in along this line, and I'm going to talk about uh, one of them, and I mentioned a few of the, uh, the variants. Uh, and this is the, uh, <clears throat> the black box estimator that I'm going to talk about. Um, it's uh, it's uh, published in iClear 2020, if you're interested in uh, re looking at the details. Um, so just to give you an, some intuition why uh, the curse of horizon can be avoided, um, let me show you this uh, circle MVP, uh, where the details can be found in the paper in, the, in our paper at New York 2018. Um, this circle MVP is shown here. It has n states, uh, two actions, uh, you can either go uh, clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, and then you have two policies. The target policy is to uh, go counterclockwise with probability rho and one minus rho the other, one, uh, the other direction. And pi zero is a symmetric one. Um, and, then, um, and then you can apply IPS or W robust. Uh, you, can you can see from the previous slide that um, this is actually, um, the variance will blow, blow up exponentially. Okay? And if you have an infinite horizon problem where H is infinite, then the variance goes to infinity. So you don't even have a well-defined uh, importance ratio or propensity score. Uh, but if you look closer in this case, pi and pi zero gives you the same distribution over states in this problem, no matter you go clockwise or counterclockwise with the same probability, you end up with the same distribution over state, which is uniform. And in this case, uh, you don't actually need to wait this, we weight the states in the data. The, uh, the weighting is just one because it's symmetric. Okay. And now, um, so it means that in some cases, it can be very inefficient if, you, if we look at the, um, uh, you do the naive IPS way, um, where if you do a naive way, um, then the variance can blow up exponentially or even goes to infinity, but actually all we need to do is just to use the weight one. Um, and, and this give you, um, inspires a way to avoid the curse of horizon. Um, and then there are two, uh, let me call it two magics to break the curse. Uh, one is to, um, the, match, the first step is to redefine the data unit. Before, um, if you look at um, the IPS, a data unit is a, um, uh, a trajectory, tau here. And that's why we, when we compute the importance ratio, it's a uh, distribution over tau. Um, but if you uh, look closely, you can rewrite this expression as a, in this form, which is an expectation of the reward when your state action is drawn from d sub pi, okay? And what is d sub pi is defined here. It's just the uh, collapsed distribution over state actions. Um, what it means is that um, it's the, uh, the average probability of visiting a state action pair if you run policy pi for each step or infinitely many steps. So it is a marginalized distribution and, and it's marginalized over time steps. Um, and one, if you have this distribution d pi, then you can uh, apply the same IPS uh, trick or important sampling trick to the bias data. And now the uh, now you need a d pi zero here. And now the new important score is just the ratio of these two distribution. Now, the good thing about this is that um, um, this distribution does not depend on h, meaning that it, it doesn't have to suffer the uh, explicitly doesn't have to suffer the curse of horizon. Um, if these two distributions ratios are small, then somehow uh, you may be able to estimate it from data more directly without having to suffer uh, exponential blow up of variance in H. Oh, can, can I ask a question? 
Sure, yeah. So is this the sub pi the called the uh, occupancy uh, probably the measure or is there yes. any difference between this one and this? Yes, um, exactly. Um, this is, uh, there are many names. Uh, one is occupancy or stationary distribution. Uh, yes, you're right. Okay, I see. Thanks. Yeah. And I'll come back to this a little bit later. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, and the, um, so going back to this slide, the intuition here is the, um, in, the, in the first step is to redefine the data unit so that we don't look at trajectory, but look at individual state action pairs to avoid the dependence on age. Um, now the second step, which is, I think is a more interesting technically is to estimate the ratio W star, which is the distribution, the ratio between two distributions. Okay. And remember that um, um, we, the data we have is, uh, is drawn from pi zero. So we only have one data set from pi zero. And now we want to estimate the d pi over d pi zero. So this is uh, challenge one. The second challenge is that uh, we don't observe the d pi directly because d pi is the occupancy or the, the long-term stationary distribution. But all we need is just local transition samples. And if you are familiar with the Markov chain theory, what it means here is that um, uh, you want to estimate the stationary distribution of a Markov chain based on chunks of transitions samples. So this seems impossible to do, but it turns out that this can be done uh, in a very interesting way, uh, an elegant way. Um, so, um, so this is how uh, what we do in magic number two um, to solve this problem. Um, it's based on this following observation that um, if you make an assumption, uh, ergodicity assumption of the Markov chain generated by, uh, controlled by policy pi, um, then it implies that uh, d pi is the unique distribution to this equation. So what it means is that here, it, what it means is that for any state action, uh, the, the left-hand side is just the, uh, the station, uh, the, uh, DSA is the distribution of SA. And then the right-hand the right hand side is, um, you can think of right-hand side as a, um, a one-step transition, forward transition of the uh, of distribution D, okay? Um, and then this equation says that um, these two are identical for every state action pair, okay? Um, does it? Um, Okay, so so this um, this equation is a little bit uh, complicated. I'm not sure if uh, people are, have seen this before. So maybe let me uh, try to explain a little bit further. Um, um, in the Markov chain, uh, the if you look at the right hand side, you can think of uh, psi and alpha as uh, the previous state and action pairs. And what d psi alpha means that uh, this previous state action are drawn from uh, distribution D, and then after you draw the psi and alpha, and then you go through the Markov chain and run it for one step to get the next state S. And the next action, because you're interested in policy pi, uh, is pi A given S. So this is a, the right-hand side, it's a, you can think of it as an operator that converts uh, the previous state psi alpha distribution to the next state action SA distribution. And, the, uh, and it says that this equation says that it has to be equal, equal to the left-hand side. So this is a, um, it may look complicated, but it's in fact a, um, the, the, almost like the definition of the stationary distribution of a Markov chain. Okay. Um, and then um, because of the uniqueness uh, conclusion, um, the distribution d pi that we care about can be uh, written as the minimizer of the discrepancy between the left hand side and right hand side of the of this equation. Okay. Um, and now it's um, easier if we can look at the data in this way. Um, oops. Uh, okay, sorry. Yeah. So now, um, um, so. One way to do, uh, to solve this D is that um, we can represent, first we need to represent D, okay? And one way to represent it is to use uh, this non parametric way of representing the D as a empirical distribution over the data. So now you, let's say you have 
a set of n transitions, S A R S prime transitions, tuples, um, and then you can write down your distribution uh, of of d pi. You can represent d pi as d w, and w is the parameter that you want to uh, estimate. And you can think of w as a um, is a uh, multinomial distribution over the n items and the n data points. Uh, and so you need to the w i to be positive and they sum up to one. And one way to make sure that happen is to have a uh, this. Uh, you First you have a, a model, a parametric model, say a new network whose parameters are omega. Um, and then and the model is always not negative. Uh, and then this gives you a w j Oh, sorry, um, there's a typo here. This should be SJ and AJ. Um, that gives you WJ tilde, and this WJ tilde is not normalized. And because we want to, the WIs to, to be normalized, so we have a normalization factor here. So at the end of the day, you can think of WI as a multinomial, is a, uh, multinomial, a multinomial distribution over n data points. Um, and then the problem of solving for DPI can be reduced to finding omega that approximately minimize the discrepancy between DW and pi and P star DW here. So now the problem of estimating uh, W can be turned into estimating or minimizing uh, the discrepancy of the two distributions. Hi, excuse me? Sure, yeah, hey. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I have a question about this uh, formulation here. So oh, okay. uh, yeah, it seems that uh, this D function actually satisfies this kind of equation listed here, right? It should be an equation for this D here. Uh, sorry, which D lowercase or uppercase I'm looking for? Oh, okay, okay. So that so that says that actually here is not equation. So yeah, okay. No, no, I think uh, it's a it's an equation. Uh, lowercase D is the occupancy probability. It is indeed an equation. Uh, yeah, the adjunct by my operator. Yeah, here. So yes, yes. Yeah, so, so so, but here, can we just try to solve out this linear equation? Essentially, um, you're right. Yeah, essentially, this is trying to solve a linear equation. The problem is that um, if you have a finite state problem, yes, you can solve it, um, and that's exactly a linear equation. Uh, but when you S A and this uh, S A sets are continuous, and then you're solving an infinite dimensional linear system. Okay, so that, that should be data, much, then, oh, okay. Then okay. you cannot solve it uh, without suffering many other technical problems. And, and that's why you need to approximately solve it using uh, in a parametric way somehow. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, this is a good question. Um, okay, um, so now we, at the end of the day, um, all what we have is the, uh, divergence minimization problem here, and the parameter we, can, uh, we optimize over is omega. Uh, in, in, in practice, we don't know the transition, uh, this P star operator, this adjoint dominant operator, but we can approximate it by data. Uh, and this is, uh, in a, this is a very natural way to approximate this. Um, uh, this is essentially the same, well, uh, you're using the empirical distribution over data set and use it and apply it, uh, and apply it to this uh, operator. Um, so at the end, uh, so this is a, a summary of this estimator. Um, given a set of data, uh, what we can do is to use this p hat defined here, which is totally based on data, um, and then use this p hat to define this divergence, which depends on data. Um, and then we minimize this omega and let the minimizer be omega hat. Uh, once we have omega hat, uh, we can compute the, the W hat weights. Uh, and we know that W hat weights are non-negative and they sum up to one. And finally, the policy value is estimated by a weight average over the rewards in the data set. And the weights are given by W hat. Okay. So I have a question. So, sure. so according to your uh, black box estimator, it seems that uh, uh, you can only uh, estimate the, the omega height or W height for those observed uh, state and action pair. Right, yeah. So uh, I wonder, uh, 
can this kind of uh, estimator be generalized to those unobserved action state pair, or is it a necessary? Is it not necessary to do that? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, uh, remember that uh, we have an omega that is a uh, parameter of the W. So, um, so if you have omega hat here, um, if you it replace S J and A J by any other S J pair, you can still compute this. You can still compute a W for those mm -hmm. unseen S A's. Okay. But here uh, in this context, um, this doesn't make a difference. Uh, it seems because uh, at the end of the day, what we care about is the is an average over the observed rewards here. If you can see my mouse. Uh, here. So what is this uh, uh, uppercase W? So uppercase W is a function or is a- It's a function. And uh, what's the form of this function? It can be any like a, as a non-parametric estimator or kernel or- um, uh, Here I'm, I'm thinking of a, a parametric way. So WSA is a, uh, the input is SA. Mm -hmm. And then omega is the, the parameters. An example is the neural network where omegas are the weights in the, in the network. Oh, okay. So this W can be considered as a linear function or even a neural network. Yes, that's right. Yep. So, oh, and then uh, how did you define the feature? Because uh, uh, for infinite dimensional state and action space, uh, do you need to specify the feature mapping if it's a, for example, a linear function approximation? Yeah. Um, yeah, so it depends. It, um, so the, the, the encoding of state actions are, uh, can be done in a similar way as uh, other RL papers. Uh, so for example, if it's S is a, um, in control problems, S could be a, 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 a multidimensional, it's a vector. Okay. Oh, okay. A, S can be vectors. Okay. Or in games, S could be an image or, or sequence of images. Okay, okay, I see. So I can understand this uh, as, a, for example, the softmax layer of some uh, neural network, right? This W. Yeah. Okay, right. okay. Yep. Thank mm -hmm. you, thank you. Yeah. And in fact, the softmax is probably useful because now you can in, in, uh, enforce that uh, the output is non negative. I see. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it, this uh, formulation is quite general. Uh, it doesn't require to um, what kind of form of uh, W it's in. Um, at the end of the day, uh, all it is is the W hat weights. Uh, and then at the end of the day, it's the, uh, the estimate is the weighted average of the rewards. And it comes back to uh, your question. Uh, it's the, um, come back to the question. Uh, you only need the W on the observed states, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. observed data, because outside of the observed data set, uh, you don't see the rewards. So even yeah. if you can estimate a W there, um, you, uh, it's not going to be used in this estimator anyway. I see, I see, thanks. Okay, yeah, so, um, so now the remaining step is to find D. Uh, there are many options to, to you choose the D, which is the discrepancy function. Uh, one way um, is the maximum mean discrepancy M or MMD. Um, it's a kernel-based approach where uh, K, you define K to be a strictly positive definite kernel uh, that defined on pairs of state actions. Um, uh, and then you can define this, uh, this function K of FG, where FG are functions on state actions to be, to be this. In, in a sense, um, if, uh, it defines a, um, some kind of a, uh, uh, a it's a function that, uh, compute the, uh, the similarity between F and G. You can think of it that way. Um, and, then, <clears throat> um, and then the, uh, the MMD uh, is defined by this. If you have D1 and D2, two distributions, uh, and the MMD is the, um, the, the K applied to D1 minus D2 and D1 minus D2. So if the, the good thing about this is that uh, D1, and when K is strictly positive definite, um, this dk function is zero, even only if d1 equals d2. Um, so you can use uh, dk to as an um, as an uh, as a choice to uh, for the d here in the black box estimator. Okay. Um, if you write down this dk form uh, using this definition, then you can see that it's a quadratic function in w, and of course um, w is a function of omega, the parameters. Um, DK in general is a non-convex uh, program uh, when the parameters are W, but um, in general, you can still apply gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent to optimize or to minimize DK, uh, to optimize omega. 
Um, and you can use other options like F divergence uh, to instead of MMD and these results in minimax optimization, which are a little bit uh, harder to optimize. Um, and it, for theory, um, uh, this method is, uh, it, I think it's quite natural, uh, but it also mathematically uh, justified. Uh, so the first theorem says that uh, it's consistent, meaning that um, would, if you have a strictly, uh, uh, you have a strictly uh, positive definite kernel, then um, when this divergence is minimized to exactly zero, then you get the, uh, the exact distribution right. And also um, gen the second theorem says, uh, gives a generalization bound um, in a sense, what it says is that um, you have a data set of size n, then the uh, generalization it's uh, converges on the order of uh, one over square n. Uh, and these are uh, pretty standard methods in uh, statistical learning theory. Um, although we have to extend it to uh, work for this uh, fixed point equations here. Um, so let me. Um, so let me quickly uh, show you some example uh, experiments. Um, this is uh, pretty uh, standard benchmark problems in reinforcement learning, carpool, pendulum, mountain car, acrobat. Uh, we compared four methods. One is the, uh, the black one is our black box method, uh, which is here. Um, uh, and the Y axis here measure the uh, root mean square error. The X is the, uh, the number of trajectories. So you can think of it as data points. Um, so the, um, the lower the better for the Y axis. And if you look at the, the method, the black box, it, it's much better than all the uh, other methods, including the blue one, which is a, pre, uh, a, pre, a, a predecessor of the black box approach. Um, is the, uh, the first approach that we come up with, uh, but it has uh, some limitations. And we show that the black box approach is, is better than the blue one. Um, and then the, the brown one is the regression estimator. Um, it, in, in some cases like this one, like mountain car and pendulum, it doesn't really learn too well. And the green one is a, it's not really a baseline, but the reference point is the, uh, it, uh, what it does is to ignore that the data is of policy. So it just simply average the, the rewards in the data set. So it's a uh, very biased. You can see that uh, it doesn't, uh, the, the green line is not, uh, does not work well. The green line is not really uh, estimating the right quantity. And in contrast, the black one is uh, very good uh, compared to all the methods. Um, and then, okay, so let in the, uh, the rest of the talk, let me uh, very briefly uh, mention a few variants. And I think that um, some of these variants will be uh, discussed in further detail by a talk uh, by Dr. Bo Dai, I think maybe next week at the same seminar. Um, so I'll let uh, Bo to talk about this uh, some of these variants. Um, I'll just mention some of them very briefly. Um, the first one is a doubly robust variant. Um, without going to details, um, I just wanted to mention that um, what we have shown in the black box estimator is based on the dual linear program formulation of MDPs. Uh, it's due in a sense that the, the variable is the, uh, the distribution d pi, distribution over state actions. Um, in the RL literature, people are more, uh, it's more popular to look at a primal version, which correspond to the Q function, the value function. Uh, these are the primal variables. Um, but you can, you can and, and these two are dual uh, problems to each other. Um, but you can look at the Lagrangian of these problems. You interestingly end up with a, a double robust estimator. The Lagrangian is a double robust estimator. Um, and, and we have a recent paper in like clear that shows that how this double robust estimator can be useful. Um, and also there are related work like uh, uh, Professor Jiang's group's uh, paper in I think it's 2000, ICML 2000 and also uh, another paper that we have recently at NIPS 2020. They rely on this, uh, uh, the, the duality structure of the, of the LP formulation and to develop uh, many OPE methods. So may I have a question? So you sure. uh, mentioned a doubly robust uh, estimator several times. So what, what is uh, this uh, specific uh, doubly robust mean? So uh, yes, why is it called a double? <laughs> this is uh, rushing a little bit, yeah. Um, so the, um, 
in the previous slide um, that I mentioned, but I didn't go into the details, um, it combines two estimators. Uh, one is the regression estimator that roughly correspond to the primal one here. And the other is the uh, IPS, which roughly correspond to the dual uh, formulation here. And then, and then what double robustness means in this context is that um, the estimator combined the dual and primal uh, variables in, in one estimator. And a nice property is that as long as you can estimate one of these, either one of these correctly, then the overall estimator is correct. Is it because of the strong duality hold or weak duality hold or so why if you can estimate one of them uh, very accurately than the, the other one? Uh, uh, what's uh, the reason if you can estimate uh, one uh, very accurately, the other one will be also estimated? Right, um, so the, the um, it, it may need some uh, the whiteboard or something to write down, but the um, I think the intuition is that uh, let's say if you get the dual variable right, um, even if you get the primal wrong, the, the way the Lagrangian or the double robust estimator is constructed ensures that um, the right part, either the dual or the primal one, the right variable will make sure the errors in the, on the other side will get canceled. Okay. I see. It's a little bit strange, but um, mm -hmm. it, it can happen. Uh, okay, I see. Uh, um, and then another one, I think Bo is going to talk about it in his talk, is uh, how to estimate uncertainty in the form of confidence intervals. Uh, in the past, people have used, uh, let's say, normal approximation based on central limit theorem to, uh, to get a confidence interval for OPE or using other things like the boost job. Uh, but these methods uh, may not work well when you have a long horizon problem uh, for the same reason that uh, the, curse, the curse of horizon uh, makes a lot of things challenging. Um, and, and then um, there we have a recent paper called Coin Dice um, that is appearing in New York this year um, that provides a way to, uh, a, a interesting way to compute confidence of intervals uh, based on the uh, the empirical likelihood method, and avoids the curse of horizon. And this method is based on the LP formulation uh, that I, I mentioned very briefly on the previous slide. Um, and then finally, um, I'm going to um, mention that uh, we have also looked at a, a extension of the estimator in when the state space of the MDP is not fully observable. Um, and then um, the model that we show here is called MDP with unmeasured confounding or MDPUC. And what it means is that um, on top of the normal uh, description of tuple of MDP, we have this uh, U, which is the unmeasured confounding variable, U here, right? Um, and these U's are IID um, and the transition reward and policy in MDP, you see are exactly the same as the MDP, except that um, this unmeasured confounding are also part of the state space. So the transition has to depend on, on, on you as well and reward and policy and et cetera, okay? Uh, the tricky thing here is, is we don't observe the you uh, and the data, well, the data doesn't have the information of you. So, um, so how to uh, consider how to do OPE when you have um, this unobserved state variable is uh, interesting. And this is uh, in, real, in practice, this is a problem that is, uh, I think is important. Um, and this MDP you see is also a, uh, a special case of positively observable MDP. Uh, it's a uh, super case, it's a superset of uh, the MDP that we have talked about. Um, and then um, um, I, I can't go into details, but the form of the estimator that we propose for MDPUC is the same as the previous one, where we have a, a weighted average of the rewards. And at the end, we also need to estimate uh, the ratio between the two distributions over SA. Uh, now, because of the IID assumption that we made about MDPUC's unobserved confounder, uh, we can cancel this uh, dependence on U and this ratio. And so we can go back to estimating the ratio of SA. Um, of course, there are uh, many other uh, details that we need to make right to, to get the right estimator. But at the end of the day, we obtain an estimator that is, um, has a nice uh, theoretical property. 
And also uh, we show that um, in the simple problem, uh, it, it seems to work pretty well. Um, this is a windy grid world uh, when the observable confounders are controlling the, um, the state transition and reward. You can think of the, the confounder as the wind that you don't observe uh, or you don't observe in the data, but it's actually uh, affects the transitions. Um, uh, and then uh, and then the winds, uh, you don't control the winds and the winds are, well, you can think of the winds as uh, ID random variable in every time steps. Uh, and then you can see that uh, our method, which is the blue line here, uh, decrease very nicely. And uh, when you have more and more data, again, the Y axis is, is the root mean square error, the lower the better. Um, in contrast, all the baselines like the, uh, the all the baselines are, are not doing well. Um, these baselines, either ignoring the unobserved confounder problem or uh, it's based on uh, regression estimator that does not, uh, uh, does not take care of the unobserved confounder problem situation. I can ask a question about the definition of this co uh, confounded one. Uh, which definition? Uh, just the previous slides. Uh, yeah, yeah, here. H here? Uh, no. Oh, uh, here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I'm not sure if this uh, U in the third bullet, uh, that, that U should be the same for all the SA and S prime or, or you should uh, vary uh, when, when the face is different SA. Right, um, it, uh, it's different in different time steps. So if you look at the second bullet, um, U1, U2, U3 are the, uh, uh, the, the, the sequence in the, uh, the trajectory. Okay, so so it, it it has nothing to do with the state and action. It only has something with the time step, right? That's right. Yeah. So yeah, in okay. every time step, it has a uh, ID sample from some unknown distribution. Okay. 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 Got it. Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, so um, so this is an uh, example of how we could uh, incorporate. Uh, causality or causal inference techniques in OPE, um, and but this is just a, uh, a relatively uh, simple uh, setting, and there are a lot remains to be done. Um, to to conclude, um, oops, to conclude um, the talk, um, let me go back to the previous uh, simplified view of reinforcement learning, where um, uh, we have the data collection, training, and then testing. Um, this talk focused on the, the last part, the evaluation, but many of these uh, techniques, especially the, du uh, the duality in RL and the dual-based techniques can be extended to the, uh, the model training part. Um, and in fact, uh, some of the, uh, Bo next week may talk about some of these methods. And uh, I think there's a, a lot of interesting thing to be done in this space. Um, so just to recap, um, um, in this talk, we talk about OPE or policy estimation. Um, I hope it, I convinced you that this is a critical bottleneck uh, to uh, apply RL in real life problems. Um, and we have seen many uh, successful examples in short horizon problems. And the extension of these methods to uh, long horizon problems has been challenging because of the curse of horizon. And now we, uh, we develop a sequence of methods to break the curse of horizon. And the black box estimator is one example. Um, and, and there are many others based on the recent family of dice uh, algorithms that uh, people may have uh, seen. Um, in the future, um, there, there are many uh, interesting directions to explore. One is to um, obtain better estimators, better in the sense that um, the estimators are easy to, to optimize. Um, some of these methods in the published work are either based on, well, either in the form of a minimax optimization, uh, which makes it uh, hard to optimize. Um, and then, so the first problem I think is important. Um, the second is a deeper uh, statistical analysis to understand uh, the data or how many data we need to, uh, for the estimator to, uh, to converge to a, a reasonable accuracy. Um, there are many other things like approximation error and, and, and also how to use this, how to use the duality based approach to model training and optimization. And some work has been done, but I think uh, more can be done in this space. Um, there are many other things in the uh, hidden confounder and, and more applications. I'm happy to talk more about this.
if you're interested. Okay, so I think I'm done with this talk and uh, okay, so the rest is the LP formulation and if, if people are interested, I can talk about them, but I can stop here, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for a great talk. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so before we move into the, for example, detailed derivation in the next slide, so I want to uh, ask whether there's any questions from audience. Yeah, so I have a general question. So uh, my understanding of, uh, of your talk is uh, you are dealing with episodic MDP. So what if the MDP is uh, like a discounted infinite horizon MDP? Uh, will this set of method, including the primal method, dual method, or primal dual method, uh, still applicable or extendable to uh, the infinite horizon MDP? Sure, um, this is a good question. Um, let me go back to the definition here, okay. Um, so here um, I, uh, I put an H here because of it, it makes my, uh, my notation easier later on. Mm -hmm. But in fact, H here can be infinite. So oh, okay. if it is infinite, then it's uh, here, the, uh, the return or the, uh, yeah, the return here, you need to, to make a, a limit mm -hmm. of uh, H goes to infinity here. Um, so so the, the, the talk here covers both finite horizon and infinite horizon. Of course, um, the later part of the talk, the black box, uh, uh, I assume that H is infinite so that you can have a single stationary occupancy uh, distribution to estimate. Right, but uh, since your data is uh, uh, finite, so do you need to uh, somehow truncate the, uh, the episode? For example, if the episode is infinite, uh, do you need to truncate the episode at the, the lines of, for example, one divided by one minus gamma? Gamma is a discount factor. Do you need to uh, do this kind of truncation or, or it's not a necessary? Uh, I'm talking about the implementation. Right, right, right. Yeah, um, yeah so here uh, um, I haven't uh, defined the discount factor gamma here in, in mm -hmm. the whole talk uh, for, uh, because um, for, for two reasons. One is that um, um, it's, um, uh, so, so one reason is that um, the discounted case can be viewed as a special case of the, the undiscounted case. Mm -hmm. uh, where um, if you look, in, in fact, in the 2018 paper the, uh, at, at NIPS, uh, we show that um, if you have a discounted problem, how you can turn the problem into a, an undiscounted case. Mm -hmm. uh, and the value of the policy in the previous cases can be uh, equivalent to written in a new case. Okay, I see. Yeah. But I see. The, the opposite can, is not true. So that's why in this talk, I only look at the, uh, the undiscounted case of gamma equals one. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Yeah. We have a yeah, question from the audience. Uh, hello, Dr. Lee. So, uh, so you mentioned that H actually is set as infinite in your later analysis. So I wonder, whether the importance weight, the, the estimate of the importance weight will uh, grow, the, the variance of the importance weight will grow with the uh, horizon lens edge. Uh, uh, so in, in, the, in the what case, the infinite case? Yes. Yeah, so in, the, um, in, in general, the larger, the larger H is, the higher the variance is. And if H is, infinity, infinite, then the variance can be infinite. I see. It, so, the, so, so is there, a, there, is there an order of the variance of the importance weight? So is that depends linearly on the on edge or? Oh, it depends. Uh, the variance depends exponentially. Oh, I see. Yeah. So this is the, um, uh, this slide here. And, and that's yeah. why it is called the curse of horizon because uh, it requires exponentially many data to counter the exponential variance. Yes, yes. Uh, and if you look at the, um, the equation up in the slide, uh, it's, uh, it's quite uh, intuitive when, um, because each pi over pi zero ratio has some variance. Let's say you have a constant variance for each lowercase t. And when you multiply each of these random variables, um, then the final variance can be uh, 
of the whole product can be exponential in age. I see. So, so is there any way to reduce the dependency? Uh, right. So the um, the two um, the two answers to your question. The first one is that um, in the worst case, it's possible to reduce that, and and we show that um, in the second bullet point here, we show that it's not possible in nice. general. In the in the worst case, uh, is because we provide a minimax rate or the lower we construct a case where uh, you the lower bound is exponential, so you can't really go below that, beyond that uh, exponential uh, blow up. So it's, it, it's in the worst cases, uh, the exponential blow up is uh, not avoidable. Um, but um, in some other cases, the benign cases here, uh, the statistical dependence may not be exponential. And many of the exponential dependence is due to the algorithm itself, let's say IPS. And the hope here uh, for the black box estimator and other dice family of algorithms is to, um, uh, to solve these benign cases. Uh, the algorithm itself does not depend on age. So if the problem is benign, then we can still have an efficient estimator. I see. Thank you. Yeah, but, but the problem, if the problem itself is hard, um, then no method can break the exponential uh, yeah, yeah. In the worst case, yeah, I can imagine that it's right. it's yeah. unavoidable. Yeah. Right. So that's the, the yeah the two answers to your question. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. So I have a follow up question. So you mentioned the benign uh, case and also the hard case. So, but uh, uh, during your presentation, I I I didn't see any like uh, uh, like a specific algorithm design uh, that. Uh, reflect the hardness or the easiness of the, the cases. So mm -hmm. I wonder why uh, in the uh, method you presented, uh, uh, it does not have the exponential dependence on the, uh, on the for example, lines of the horizon. Yeah, so that's, a, yeah, you, um, you, <laughs> you asked the right question. Um, I haven't explicitly defined what is benign and what is hard. Uh, in, in the talk because um, it's it's one of the open problems that I, at least uh, open to me that I don't know how to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, my intuition of, of benign cases are uh, the cases where um, uh, the, the distribution, uh, the mixing time or what is that? Something like the mixing time, it's small. Oh, okay, I see. Or, or something related to that. Okay, so in your analysis, you need the, for example, uniform ergodicity this kind of assumption? Uh, the ergodicity assumption is to make sure that uh, d pi exists and is unique. Oh, but because uh, uh, ergodicity, there's, a, for example, uh, the parameter which uh, characterizes how fast uh, it uh, converges to the uh, this, uh, stationary diffusion, right? So would that parameter uh, it I, appear in your, for example, sample complexity uh, or statistical rate result, or that complexity measure will not appear. Um, maybe some of them are, um, there are many uh, terminologies. I'm not sure we're using the same terminology, but um, mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's related to mixing, what you just described. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's the mixing, the speed of mixing. Or will the, for example, diameter of the uh, MDP appear in your result? Uh, um, so far, it's not, okay. it's not in the in the bound or the algorithm. But I as a, but I would guess that some quantities like this would be um, would play a role in the performance of the algorithm. I see. I see. I see. But it's, yeah. it's unclear. It's open. So um, okay. So that's yeah. why I put the quotes in the benign. Because okay. Due to I see. And then an example is this problem where you have a... <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So any other question? Okay. So if there's no more questions, let's thank uh, Dr. Lee again for the great talk. Yeah. Thank you everyone for the attention. Thank you. And for the questions. Yeah. Thank you.